All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. I will admit to you, I'm always a little nervous when it's just me and Max isn't here. Max is like my safety net. And so I know that no matter what happens when Max is here, Max can step in and make it all smooth and everything, right? Well, you just stuck with me today, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, our scripture for today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, and this is from the J.B. Phillips translation again. The spirit of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe and prevents the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the image of God, from shining on them. For it is Christ Jesus the Lord whom we preach, not ourselves. We are your servants for God's sake. God who first ordered light to shine in darkness has flooded our hearts with his light. We now can enlighten men only because we can give them knowledge of the glory of God as we see it in the face of Jesus Christ. This is a word about God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now last week we talked about living an authentic life. We talked about celebrating our freedom. We talked about learning to walk in the light, remember? And to live outside of the darkness for all the world to see us. We talked about the fact that sometimes you have to learn the signals that your body gives you that lets you know when you're not walking as one who is bathed in the light. Like on those days when I have to lock myself in my office, right? I know those signals when I'm uh, going to be grouchy all day. And we talked about getting used to being authentic with each other and not hiding our vulnerabilities, but sharing them so that we can heal and that we can bring healing to each, other's, to each other. We also talked about the fact that Jesus revealed God slowly to them because God was more than they could imagine that God actually was. Remember, all they knew about God was God was the law. God was the Ten Commandments. God was all the laws in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus. They lived according to those traditions and laws. And so in that time when Jesus walked, there were either law followers or law breakers. And if you were not Jewish, you were automatically a law breaker. Their entire relationship with God rested on whether or not they could follow those laws. But what Jesus revealed to them was that it wasn't about the law. Jesus revealed to them that the authentic God that we serve is love, not law. And that serving and believing in a God of love is so much better than trying to follow the, God, the, law, the laws of God. Now, I will tell you that loving God makes you want to follow those laws. Loving God makes you want to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God makes you want to do the right things. So we don't ignore the law when we fall in love with God. We just recognize that part of serving God and being committed and a faithful follower of the risen Christ includes following those laws that he gave us. And then the last thing we talked about last week was that quote from the Christian Standard. Remember? Yeah, I'm going to read something from a conservative magazine two weeks in a row. But I, love, I just love it. I love it. I'm not sure they know it was in there. I think they might have taken this out if they'd seen it. But remember the quote said that real discipleship can happen only where there's authenticity. If we can't be real and admit our faults and frailties to one another, we cannot mature beyond where we are. What's the purpose of going to church? What's the purpose of studying and praying and walking with God, right? is to become more mature spiritually, to become more connected to God. We can't do that, according to this article, if there is no authenticity among us. But when we build an environment where we can be real with one another, sin loses its grip on us. Because when people love us anyway, 
We have the encouragement we need to do battle against the world, or as Paul said in this letter to the Corinthians, against the spirit of the world that would blind us. So being vulnerable with each other, being authentic with each other gives us the power to fight against that spirit that would blind us. And the last thing it says is the accountability of our friends helps us live the life we want to live but can't live by ourselves. So that was what we talked about last week, about living an authentic life. So this, time, this week we're going to talk about that a little further. We're going to talk about being God's authentic people. How will people look at us? Right? They'll know they are Christians by their love. First of all, to effectively function as God's authentic people, you have to understand God. You've got to have a robust understanding of who God is. And so if we look at, before we start there, if we look at the word authentic, I looked at some definitions yesterday because I was, I was having some trouble with this sermon. I didn't like the way I, it came together. And so I spent a couple hours working on it yesterday. But um, So th there's a definition of authentic that says authentic is being of undisputed origin. Right? This is the real thing you've got here. Uh, I know where this came from. Right? The problem with that is that that's not really how we understand God, is it? As having a, an origin. In our world, God has always been. There's never been a time where God wasn't. And so that, that definition doesn't really fit in with us. Now the Webster's Online Dictionary says that authentic implies being fully trustworthy as according with fact, like a fact. As in, this is the authentic truth. Like, it's a fact that the temperature is going to be 90 degrees outside today. I have a thermometer that proves that. I can see the number. My question is, though, can you point to something that proves that God, proves that God exists? You have a thermometer? Oh, we're about 78 degrees of Holy Spirit in here today. Right? There's no... There's no thermometer. We can't point to some scientific thing and say, yes, this, this is how we know we serve an authentic God. But we understand, right? We know God to be fully trustworthy. We believe God is authentic. Even without a thermometer to measure it, we believe it. In my mind, and, and after yesterday spending some time wrestling with this. I, I believe being authentic just means being the real thing. Now, I, I know some of you were alive in the 70s. <laughs> Barely. Yeah, please. <laughs> That's funny. So in 1972, in 1972, in 1972, Coca-Cola had a marketing campaign. Came out with a marketing campaign. Some of uh, you remember, right? The whales are shaking their head. Now, I'm going to try this, okay? I may embarrass myself. Um, but it was a, a commercial. It was a commercial of about, I don't know, 100 young people from all over the world, and they were standing on the hillside in Italy. Do you, do you remember? All right, and it goes like this, and I want you to sing with me because I know many of you can sing this. I'd like to buy the world a home and burnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honey bees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. That's the real thing, what the world wants today is the real thing, what you're hoping to find is the real thing. You remember that? Yeah. Blake and, yeah, right? Blake and Shannon are going. <laughs> Never 
I'm going to tell you right now, as one who's spent my life addicted to Coca-Cola, this is a praise and worship song right here. <laughs> being authentic means being the real thing. How many of you remember, uh, uh, what was it called? The other Coke. They, there was real Coke, and then that funny-looking thing came out in that weird can, and they called it something different. No, this, I don't know. They called it real Coke, right? But they weren't fooling us, were they? Yeah, we, t new Coke. Yeah, we, uh-uh, get this new Coke out of here. We want some old Coke, right? We want some old Coca-Cola. That's so funny. I listened, I watched this YouTube video about six times yesterday. I just, I just loved it. Anyway, we know God is the real thing. We know God's the real thing. We know because we read about God. Right? We have this whole book full of things that teach us about God. Some of it's not ours. The entire Old Testament belongs to the Jews. That's the Hebrew Bible. But we have assimilated it into our faith tradition. And so we learn about God from these scripture. This is our primary source about God. But then that's not all we do. We have our traditions, right? We have, we have new, new folks joined our church today. In just a little while, we're going to have communion. We're going to celebrate. What time is it? Okay. We're going to celebrate the tradition. I, man, y'all got started singing. I've lost all track of time. All right. We may have to have another sermon next week on this. Anyway, so we, we know through our traditions, right, that God is real. We know using our intellect, right? We learn things about God. We listen to each other. We, we, we process those in our brains. And finally, the reason that God is real, the reason that I know and that you know that God is the real thing is because we experience God. God is present and active and moving in our lives and we can feel that presence and that power and that love. And it makes it the real thing for us. It's why I love becoming a Methodist. I spent my life in another faith tradition telling me from a pulpit that looked a lot like that one, this is what the Bible says and this is what you need to believe. And don't worry about reading it. I'll let you know what it says. And I joined the Methodist church and I came and went to a Methodist seminary and I learned that there's so much more to it than that. Than that. And it made so much sense to me. That I, that I read about God, that I think about God, that I follow the same traditions that millions of Christians have followed all these lives and that I experience the living God in my life. And God, because of those four things, is the real thing in my life and in your life. So what does it take then to be God's authentic people? Now y'all need to hold on because i got about five minutes. And we... Oh, it's not as bad as I thought. But you ready? Hold on. We're about, to have, we're about to have gusts of conversation up to about 30 miles an hour. So being God's authentic people means we do our best to be like God. Now that's a tall order. Right? Be like God? Be like Jesus? Uh, and I'm not even close. I'm not even close. More maybe like Thomas, the doubting Thomas. Right? Sometimes I act like Judas. Sometimes I betray my Lord with my actions and my deeds. I, I'm, I'm nowhere near being anything like Jesus Christ. But he, see, here's the thing. We have misinterpreted God's expectation of us. And it's funny because we've got this whole Bible filled with God's authentic people. And so I want to bring to mind for you some of these folks. The woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember her? She's been bleeding for 12 years. What's not pointed out specifically in that, in that passage is that when women bled, they had to stay away from everybody. They were unclean. For 12 years, this woman had been isolated and kept apart from her community. That woman with the issue of blood, she was one of God's authentic people. Do you know why? 
Because God's authentic people need healing. The prodigal son, it's my favorite story, the prodigal son was one of God's authentic people. You know why? Because God's authentic people, they need forgiveness and they need restoration. The woman at the well, do you remember her? The Syrian woman at the well. She was one of God's authentic people too. Because God's authentic people need to be welcomed into any situation at any time, regardless of their ethnicity. Mary and Martha, do you remember the story of Mary and Martha, right? Martha's running around cooking, cleaning the kitchen, making sure all the guests, that their wine is full, right? Then Martha reminds me of Linda Parker. Always, right? Have y'all noticed when we were up eating, Linda's always running around making sure everybody has what they need, right? And Bill's following her around going, what can I do, honey? What can I do? Because <laughs> Bill knows he's the boss. <laughs> But Mary and Martha, Mary and Martha were God's authentic people because God's authentic people need to show hospitality to each other. And God's authentic people sometimes just need to sit at the feet of Jesus the way Mary did and just worship and just be in the presence of a risen Savior. That centurion whose child was dying, do you remember that story? Stopped Jesus on the road and said, Dude, no, you don't have to come. Just please say the word and she'll be healed. That centurion whose child was dying, that's one of God's authentic people. Because God's authentic people need to have faith in the face of illness and death. Lazarus, raised from the dead. Lazarus was one of God's authentic people. Because God's authentic people need raising from the dead sometimes when we've lost our connection to our Savior. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. God doesn't expect us to be like God. God expects us to be real, just the way God is real. And we can be God's authentic people because we don't have to wonder who God is. Scripture tells us that God is love. Our reason tells us that that's a mystery to us. Our tradition tells us that God is consistent. And our experience tells us that God is always with us. We don't have to wonder. Being God's authentic people, that gives us the freedom to be ourselves. It gives us the opportunity to receive God's mercy and God's grace. It gives us the freedom because we know that we may hide things from each other. God knows everything. Bill Wheeler, God knows. God's watching. Yeah. God knows everything. Being God's authentic people means that we're working to get to the place where when we see God's creation, we see it through God's eyes. Being God's authentic people means that we're able to love each other and to love this planet with God's love. Being God's authentic people means that when we do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, we immediately ask for forgiveness quickly. When we forget something or we overlook something, we immediately make amends. Being God's authentic people means that we can tell each other the truth. And folks, here's the truth. People have flaws and failures. People have traumas and grief and joy all jumbled together. And what you see on the outside may not be what's going on on the inside. And when you face somebody and they react and respond in a way that you don't understand, it's years of things that have happened to them that have responded. And part of being God's authentic people and growing in maturity and in spirituality and in our relationship with God and with each other means that we are able to process that baggage and maybe, maybe even one day leave it behind. Being God's authentic people. Means that we can still worship a God we can't see while living in a world that breaks our hearts. 
Paul told those people in Corinthians, he told that church that their eyes were being blinded by the spirit of the world. And that because of that, they weren't able to see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ that was shining on them. And God finishes that scripture by saying, those of us who have seen the face of Christ, y'all, Paul never saw Christ. God spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus, but Paul never saw anything. As a matter of fact, Paul was struck blind in that moment so that he couldn't see anything. Paul never saw the, uh, the real human God made flesh walking around us. Paul never laid his eyes on Jesus Christ. And yet Paul knew what God looked like because Paul laid his eyes on the followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm way off this sermon. I have no idea where I am right now. But here's what I want to tell you. God's authentic people, God, they love authentically. God's authentic people love perfectly. We can't be perfect, but we can love perfectly. God's authentic people, we lend a helping hand when a hand needs to be helped. Sometimes we ask for help. God's authentic people, also sometimes they need groceries and they need their rent paid and some help with the electric bill. God's authentic people are the real thing with each other. I'd like to buy you all a Coke right now. I'm, did I make y'all thirsty? I'm thirsty for that, you know, that burn, that Coca-Cola burn, right? So I just want to finish with this one question for you. Is the spirit of this world interfering with the light of the glorious Christ in your life? This is Pentecost, folks. This is the second Sunday of Pentecost. This is our tradition of celebrating that moment when Jesus breathed onto the apostles the spirit of the living God. That spirit, that power, that breath still rests on us. It's still ours. We are the authentic people of God. Because we are the real thing, folks. We're it.